<laughs> okay. Um, uh, Annie, did you want to say something about questions now or later? Uh, for well, I guess it questions. depends. Yes, it depends on our speakers. Would you rather be interrupted as you're going along, or would you rather have questions saved for the end? Save for the end. Okay, that's what we'll do then. All right. Okay, well, hi. Um, thank you all for coming and joining us tonight, and welcome to La Lucha Continua, which is an ongoing, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, it's an ongoing series of discussions and presentations organized by the Barcelona chapter of Democrats Abroad, and also in this case by the Women's Caucus of Democrats Abroad Spain. So we're really excited to have been able to offer you all the opportunity to watch the documentary, Nine to Five, The Story of a Movement, the previously untold story of the fight that inspired the hit movie and song and changed the American workplace. Uh, as those of you who've been able to see it know, it offers a splendid portrayal of what it meant to be part of the groundbreaking nine to five organization and its sister union, SIEU Local Nine to Five. So I'd like to start by saying a few words about the co-directors of, of the documentary, Julia Reichert and Stephen Bogner. Julia's career spanned several decades. It began in the 1970s with such iconic documentaries as Growing Up Female and Union Maids, the, the Academy Award nominated Union, union Maids. And in later years, uh, included collaborations with her husband, Stephen Wagner, culminated in the Oscar winning American Factory uh, available on Netflix and in Nine to Five, the story of a movement, uh, the, the documentary we're gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, Julia died just uh, last December at the age of 76. Oh. And she'll be remembered as a truly revolutionary documentarian of women's lives. We would especially like to thank Stephen for his generosity in allowing us to share their film with all of you today, especially considering that it's not available here in Spain on Netflix, although it is in the US. I'd also, of course, like to thank our guests, uh, Ellen Cassidy and, and Kim Cook for joining us to discuss the, the documentary about nine to five and their experience in the organization itself. So Ellen uh, is not only a founder of the nine to five organization of uh, women office workers that began in Boston 50 years ago. She's also the author of a, a new book uh, called Working Nine to Five, a women's movement, a labor union and the iconic movie which has a foreword by Jane Fonda. The book has been lauded as a must read for any activist or reader in search of inspiration. I think that includes all of us. Ellen is the award-winning author of several other books as well and is also an award-winning translator and a former columnist for the Philadelphia Daily News and a speech writer in the Clinton administration. She lives now in New York City. And Kim is the past president of the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, Local 9 to 5, Ooh. which is now a local of 26,000 child care and public sector workers in Washington state. She began her work in as a member activist of the organization 9 to 5, and then was hired on as an SEIU organizer in 1984 and organized workers around the country. Kim was elected president of SEIU Local 9 to 5 in 2001 and went on to serve on the SEIU International Executive Board and as an international vice president. In 2010, she was hired to build and lead a new department at SEIU called Member Leaders in Action. Kim is also one of the co-founders of Flash Mobs for Social Justice. I know she's especially proud of them. Uh, <laughs> she retired as an associate at the Cornell Worker Institute in New York City uh, not long ago. And I have to confess that Kim and I went to college together many years ago. And when she um, arrived in Barcelona to spend a few months here, I took advantage of the opportunity to talk her into uh, joining us and helping us organize this session today. So thanks, Kim. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Ellen and Kim, and they're going to talk a little bit about their experience and then uh, open it up for questions. Great. Thank you, Jackie. And thanks so much for inviting me and Kim to speak to you today. 
I'm really glad you got a chance to see the documentary, those of you who've seen it already, about the nine to five movement. And we were so honored when Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar signed on to direct this film. And we miss Julia hugely. She was truly, as you said, a revolutionary who did so much for documentaries and for women and for working women. So I'm gonna say a few words and Kim is after me, and then we look forward to hearing from you and questions and comments. 50 years ago on a cold December morning, I was one of 10 women office workers who fanned out across downtown Boston to pass out the first issue of the nine to five newsletter. And the front page said this, we keep Boston's businesses and institutions running smoothly. Without us, they would grind to a halt, yet we are underpaid and undervalued. And I was 22 years old, working as a clerk typist at Harvard University, my first job out of college. And the 10 of us were concerned about low pay, unequal pay, training men to be our own supervisors, and having to do favors, all kinds of favors for our bosses. The lack of respect, as one woman said, they call us girls until the day we retire without pension. At that time, when people thought worker, they pictured a man in a hard hat wielding a wrench. Women workers, especially office workers, were virtually invisible. You saw in the documentary how a student walked into our office one day and looked around and said, isn't anybody here? Well, I'm here. But in the early 1970s, the economy was changing. And of the millions of women who were pouring into the workforce, one in three was now an office worker. And as the clerical workforce grew by leaps and bounds, so did a sense of injustice among the women whose job it was to type and file and staple and mimeograph and photocopy. We looked around at one another and felt united as women. We wanted our rights and we wanted respect. And our goal was not just to get women out of the typing pool, but to make the typing pool a better place to work. As Elise Bryant, who's the president of the Coalition of Labor Union Women says, there are no menial jobs, just menial pay. Among the 10 of us, our dreams were huge. We were keenly aware of the chain of working women's activism that stretched back to the garment women of the early 20th century, who went on strike by the tens of thousands and galvanized the labor movement of their day. The brave women who supported the sit-down strikers in the auto and steel industries in the 30s and 40s, and on up through the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, and the women's liberation movement, whose ideas had seeped into every corner of American society. Maybe we thought, maybe now it's our turn to forge our own link in the chain. Maybe we could change the modern office, change the labor movement, change the world. We thought big. But women who worked in offices were scared to take action, and rightfully so. In the downtown office workforce, there was little or no history of collective action. When you had a problem, you were likely to think of it as your own individual personal problem. Maybe you should dress better or take a class. The idea of sitting down across the table to engage in formal negotiations with management was virtually unimaginable to many women. And employers, of course, were intent on keeping it that way. The working conditions were very authoritarian. You couldn't leave your cubicle and go talk to someone else without your supervisor noticing. And when we handed out our leaflets outside the big skyscrapers, inside the revolving doors, there would be supervisors waiting to snatch those leaflets out of the hands of women workers. So how are we gonna solve that problem? How are we gonna get off the ground? Well, we started small with lunch. We started out by calling up all the people who'd written in in response to the newsletter and inviting them to lunch one by one. And sometimes I ate three lunches in one day. And that's how I learned a very important principle of organizing, which is never bring an artichoke to a recruitment lunch. The heart of every lunch was listening. We listened really carefully to how our lunch mates spoke, the words they used, what they were concerned about. Many women told us before they even sat down in no uncertain terms, I do not consider myself a feminist. So, okay, we could live with that. We didn't let vocabulary get in the way of solidarity. And it all came together. We perfected the art of raising a huge ruckus all over town. You could not avoid us and things began to change. 
Soon we were taking on the biggest and the baddest corporate titans and driving them mad. We went national. We made a point of targeting cities with diverse workforces in order to build a strong multiracial organization. We targeted Baltimore, Cleveland, Atlanta, and we placed a priority on developing a diverse membership, leadership, and staff that would reflect the makeup of the clerical workforce itself. And that's something that didn't just happen. It took conscious work, and it's something I'm very proud of. Coast to coast, we won millions of dollars in back pay and raises, and countless bosses began getting their own coffee. You saw in the documentary how exciting it all was. It was really exciting. It was our movement that inspired the Hollywood movie in 1980, which was a huge box office success, and Dolly Parton's toe-tapping anthem said it all. The movie gave our movement a huge boost. After the movie came out, we had won the debate, and now it was time to consolidate our power, and that meant a union. And Kim is going to talk to you about that phase of our movement. So what did we achieve and what remains to be done? If you look at the documentary, as somebody just said a few minutes ago, isn't it interesting how some of those images from 50 years ago seem so outdated, so antique? Things really did change. Issues that used to be considered individual matters are now matters of policy, corporate policy, government policy, union policy. Pregnancy discrimination is illegal today. Sexual harassment is illegal. We don't have help wanted male and help wanted female ads in the newspapers anymore. And managerial jobs have opened up to women with college degrees. But as we know, it can be harder to be a worker in today's economy than it was 50 years ago. In the gig economy, some people are working two and three jobs just to put food on the table. The good news is the surge of labor organizing we see across our economy, and that gives me hope. The day after Donald Trump was inaugurated, the streets of cities across America filled with women, women marching. And that was the day I decided to write my book, Working Nine to Five. It's the story of women joining together, growing together, winning together. Jane Fonda wrote the foreword. And it's not only my personal story, but the story of a larger movement. So if you're looking for more beyond the documentary you've just seen, take a look at my book. And uh, the information is in the chat. You can order it wherever books are sold. One last comment before I turn it over to Kim. While I was doing the research, for the book, I opened up a box of old papers and I found a little clipping that had a quote on it. I had clipped it out of a magazine 50 years ago and it said this, through our great good fortune in our youth, we were touched with fire. And that's what it was like for me and for so many women in the working women's movement. Thank you and now here's Kim. Thanks Ellen and thank you all so much for inviting us. I was so thrilled uh, not only that there's an organization called Democrats Abroad, but uh, there are women's caucuses within it uh, and that you continue to do great political work. So thank you all for your the work that you do. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the union side of 9 to 5, because that was really when I came into the organization. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit about the making of the film. But um, before that, I want to ask you a question. And if you can either raise your hand or use the reactions to answer my question. Let me first say, everybody in the room, who has seen the nine to five film, the Dolly Parton, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin film? Has every, is everybody seen it? Probably folks who are not on the screen. I have a young woman, Julia, have you not seen it? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, I always, I use these young women who haven't seen it. It's like, oh, you have to see this film. You have to see it. It's really fabulous. So before you saw this documentary, how many of you knew that that movie was based on a women's organization, nine to five, that later became a union? No, you didn't. How many of you did know that beforehand? Well, Jackie knew a couple. Couple of you knew that. Okay, so you guys were you guys were in the know. But the, it is really actually one of the reasons Julia wanted to make this film is because most people knew this movie, nine to five, right? But they didn't know the history uh, of where that movie came from. So let me just say a couple quick things. Uh, when I got out of college, I joined 9to5, but Ellen and others had already done all this great organizing of women workers and had already started the process of creating a union. So I was lucky uh, to come in at a time when they were just kicking off uh, the union. 
But I knew, I mean, I knew when I came into it that I wanted, that I believed in unions. My mother had been in a union, but I also, frankly, my experience, if you saw the movie, you may remember my experience was that unions were male and sexist and white uh, and, uh, you know, top down. And it wasn't the kind of organization I wanted to be a part of. So my hope was that these women were going to be able to create a new kind of union. Right. And that it was going to be based on the kind of organizing that we did in nine to five, the association. Right. It'd be based on women leading. It would be based on, on leadership development of members being really at our core. Right. It would be based on really around relationships, building relationships and trust, um, gaining trust and respect for each other. Uh, and I will add, most importantly, it was about having fun. Right. And making fun, right, of the bosses and having fun with it. And, you know, ultimately, I, you know, I took that to flash mobs uh, in my union days. Um, so I felt like we had to have fun uh, in our union. It had to be a different kind of union. But when I came in, I got after I was a member for a while, I got hired as an organizer. I worked as an organizer for the union all around the country. We were a national union, so I organized all over the country. Um, we did try to organize some insurance companies. We wanted to take on the big boys, um, but it was the 80s. We got our butts kicked, you know, big union busting. Where we were most successful was in universities, uh, clericals, and you saw a lot of that in the, in the film. She covers a number of the university campaigns uh, that we are involved in. Um, and... Um, so we were successful all over the country in universities and organizing. In the late 1990s, SEIU restructured along geographic um, and industry lines. And that was when, I don't, I don't think Julia got this right in the movie. I don't think the union went away or that we failed. I think we restructured based on a strategic decision to restructure. Uh, so we no longer had a national uh, clerical union. What we did is we had nine to five in Washington state where I happened to be. Uh, and at that time, the clerical industry, as we had thought of it, didn't really exist as an industry, right? The jobs were changing. It wasn't really an industry. Um, so we were sort of thinking about what was the next generation of low-wage women workers we could organize. And that was when childcare workers found us, right? They found 9 to 5. And um, that was really when we started organizing childcare workers in the late, in the mid-90s, late 90s. And I will just say that most exciting campaign I ever worked on all my years of being an organizer was when Washington state became the second state in the country to um, pass a law to allow um, family child care providers, people who provide child care in their homes to organize a union, right? We passed a law that allowed them to come together and organize a union statewide. So that was exciting. We, it was the most like maybe impactful organizing I ever did. We, 10,000 women workers joined our union uh, in that campaign. And I think, you know, made a huge difference uh, in their lives and in the power that they felt uh, in the world and politically. So uh, I think it was the beginning of what is now continuing uh, is a movement for raising respect and wages for childcare workers. God, God knows, you all know, it's not done yet, right? There's so much uh, more to be done. Um, so, that was um, that organizing continues. The union continues in Washington State. Um, I want to just say one quick thing about making the film um, because I was I worked with Julia and Steve on it from the very beginning, going to archives with them, going through boxes and boxes of old stuff in the union hall. Um, it took them eight years to make this film. So it was a really fascinating process for me to watch because of all the archival footage that they went through all the uh, hours and hours and hours of interviews that they did, of course, most of which didn't make it into the film. Uh, and the other thing that they did a lot of is that they, throughout that process, they would show the film as it was developing to audiences and get their feedback. Like, what did you, what did you think of this? How was it landing? What were your questions? And what they learned and what I learned is that with audiences that don't know unions, it was hard for them to understand. Like, what's the process of getting a union? How do you get a union? Where does it come from? And, you know, like that people had a hard time even following this film because they didn't understand the process. And even worse, frankly, is people who knew unions and were in unions, they were even harder to please because they were so critical of the film, right? It wasn't, wasn't accurate enough. It didn't have enough detail in it. So it was an interesting process, but they went through years of, of 
testing, like field testing this film. And then the I sat on a lot of panels with Julia and Steve after the movie came out. And I heard them talk about why they made this film. And I think maybe Jackie and Ellen have said a little bit of that. But they both were very pro-union and they wanted to tell workers stories. And so all the films that they've made, if you've seen them, including American Factory, the Academy Award winner, is an amazing, are amazing films about workers' lives and workers told from workers' uh, perspective. Uh, and when, if you ask Julia why she made this movie, um, she would say, I really want this movie to be for the next generation of organizers. You know, I want them not to only maybe learn something from this movie, but I want them to be inspired by this movie. So that's why she takes the film like full circle to this, to the women's at marches and uh, to the actions and the organizing that's going on today. So I just want to end there by saying again, you know, how much uh, we miss Julia and how much we love her and Steve, she were there. They're just brilliant filmmakers and so make sure you see all their films. <laughs> so thanks again. Well, thank you both. This is, um, I'm, I, I just think that we are so fortunate to have a chance to share this film and hear your personal stories. Um, I was, I was really blown away by the movie as I watched it yesterday because I I remember Dolly Parton and I remembered you know her toxic boss and uh -huh. how much better my life as a young woman working when I started working in the 1980s probably was because of her but um I didn't I didn't really think about the rest of it I spent most of my working life here in Spain so I haven't mm -hmm. had a lot of uh a lot of chance to to really experience the American version of this um, so we, our first question is from Lisa Berger. You want to jump on, Lisa? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I wanted to thank you, Jackie, for um, organizing this or, or inviting Kim Cook and Ellen Cassidy. And um, I just want to say that um, Julia Reichert was an inspiration to me when I was made my, before I made my first film, she was like the godmother of documentary film. And when she died, I felt just, oh, I was so sad. So I'm sh so glad to sh share this time with you. And um, so let's see. Um, one thing I wanted to say was uh, that she started New Day Films, which is something we didn't mention because there's so many things to talk about with uh, Julia. And New Day and Films was a distribution company because I think she started to make documentaries and then saw how do people get them because especially before online before anything um, it was hard to get documentaries before people's eyes and so she said well let's do something about it so she started this cooperative and um, so that's another legacy I think it still exists um, and so I wanted to um, just Talk about Spain. Um, I, I remember a few years ago there was actually a women's strike um, on March eighth. There, there's um, has been a demonstration for years, but I think it was 2018 was the first time there was actually a strike. And when I worked at a production company, they let us go on strike, and they didn't take uh, take out that out from our wages. And it was a strike against um, taking care of people, everything. I mean, you know, our children were supposed to make their own lunch. You know, that was the idea. Just say, okay, this is to make you realize that all the things we do that you don't even see because they just are seamless. Um, so that's something I don't think happens in the States. I don't know from my experience. I haven't seen that. I think I was surprised to see that here and pleased um, by the young woman. And um also, I wanted to say that, um, oh, I, I, I thought that the it was very um, educational. Um, I took a lot of notes during the film and are applicable to Democrats abroad. And one of the things I will just mention here, which we can talk more among us, is how to organize. Um, and there was an on-screen list, and it said, engage, uh, define issues, create a meeting place and um, create campaigns and actions that can be won and claim publicity for them. I mean, that's great. I think we should, you know, put that on our website, if you don't mind, um, because, you know, the idea of take actions that can be won, um, you know, it seems so overwhelming, everything that needs to be done and to take, take little bits 
and then see that your um, efforts can have an impact is very empowering. So I thank you for, for that and well, for all of you, um, eight years um, of work. So anyway, we can talk again later. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's interesting, Lisa, I just want to say in the film, they found some old footage of, of, of some TV announcer saying that today is a national women's strike in the United States, right? And it must have been before my time because I don't remember it. Ella, did it, does anybody remember it? Did it actually happen in the 70s? Yes, it did. It was on April 26, uh, August 26th, which was the uh, anniversary of winning women's suffrage, Women's Equality Day. Yeah. And it was, I can't remember exactly when it was, but like the late 60s. But nothing since, so you can go here in Spain, you guys. Your, your sound went a little funny there, Kim. I don't know if your microphone is. Yeah, can you hear me? That's better. I was just cheering on your strike efforts here. It's very exciting that you were able to pull off something like that in the most recent future, having most recent past, having run a union for many years and trying to get people to go out and strike. Uh, I know how hard it is and how, how scary it is for people, but it's exciting when people do it. Probably the closest thing in the United States was the, the Trump rallies, right? The women's marches after Trump was elected. And so many women just said, I'm done. I'm out in the streets for the day. If nobody else has a question, I'm going to jump in with one that I wanted to ask because it's right in line with this. Um, am I? Can I go, Julia, or do you want? Oh to yeah, ask? please do. Okay. Um, my question is about motivating people. So, like, how do you inspire people who are unwilling to unionize or to otherwise join an organization? How do you, how do you break through to them when they've got this inherent resistance? to standing up even for something that's in their own best interest. But it's really not in their own best interest to keep staying saying on the sidelines. What 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 is the secret sauce there to get people off their butts and and doing something? Because you know, it I mean sometimes it really feels kind of lonely as an organizer, you know? Um I think if you watch the film, you'll see really a lot of attention paid to that issue. And uh, in one particular place, the University of Cincinnati, they just go almost minute by minute about how they went and talked to every single person, not once, not twice, over and over and over again. And in our organization, we, um, we had to let go of a lot of assumptions when we were starting nine to five before it was a union, before we started the union. Um, we thought people were gonna be ready to link arms and go striding into their boss's office and demand things. That almost never happened. So we had to step back and think about, okay, what are women ready to do? What will they do? I, there's one thing I write about in my book where I'm organizing in the, the publishing industry and just getting off the ground and there's gonna be a big book festival. And I think, oh, that sounds like a great place to throw up a picket line. So I proposed this to our group and there was like this dead silence. And then someone said, well, why don't we just rent a table there? And I thought, oh gosh, that's so mild. It's so ugh. We rented a table, people were dying to staff the table. And within weeks we had a huge list of people from all over the industry and it was the beginning of great stuff. So people were able to take those steps themselves and decide, okay, I'm willing to do this. And then I'm willing to do that next thing. And then the next thing. And it wasn't a question of, okay, will you like go all out right this second? People were nurtured along the way. And we realized that leaders were going to be uh, made, not found. You know, you can't just sort of walk in and look around and okay, this person's gonna do this and that one's gonna do that. No, really listening, really being close to the ground and, and really being side by side with people. I was um, I was kind of shy. I was I don't think of myself as someone who's like, uh, destined to be out there in front leading the column of, you know, marchers. Um, and that really helped me because I could tell that who else was kind of shy and who else was feeling a little unsure. And I could get with those people and sort of lead from behind and help them. So Kim, I don't know if you have something to add. 
Yeah, no, I would say, you know, similar, the number one rule in organizing is, uh, you know, work with people from where they're at, right? Start with where they're at and figure out um, what, you know, what will they respond to? What do they care about? Maybe it's not the issues that you care about. Maybe it's something else, right? Find out what it is. But for us, it was always about um, doing something a little uh, maybe funner or you know, <laughs> softer than many of us wanted to do to figure out what people were comfortable with and what would they would do. I mean, if they don't care about your issue, I mean, let's be clear. When I would organize a union and we had a certain workforce we had to organize, we knew there were a third of the people who were with us that cared about these issues. We just had to figure out how to get to them. There were a third of the people who will never be with us, right? They will never care about what we care about and they will always vote no. And then there's the people in the middle who it's about who talks to them, who influences them, who do they listen to, uh, and how do you approach them? So that was pretty much the 30, 30, 30 rule the entire time I was organizing in the union. So. And that probably sounds familiar to people who are active in Democrats abroad, right? Because it's true about all kinds of organizing. Yeah. Julia, you want to go now? I do. So, so um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the movie. I, I just heard about this uh, event tonight, so I haven't had a chance to watch it. And I, the other thing I wanted to say is one of the things I just want to share is that all around the world on that Women's March Day, there were women marching in capitals and cities all over. We marched in Prague and um, everyone marched in Barcelona. So we were all with you and standing with you that day. Um, and uh, just kind of continuing on Annie's question, um, did you have gaps across generations that you had to consider how to, to reach over and how did you handle those gaps? You wanna start, Ellen? Kim, go ahead. Um, gaps in generations, I would say yes. It was always harder um, for me, and I don't know if this is your case, Ellen, to uh, reach older women uh, when I was young. So there's so this question of whether organizers, you know, people need to see themselves as organizers, right, right, to relate to them. But when I was young, it was harder for me to relate to older women, uh, especially if, um, you know, they they weren't there, you know, they weren't at all there. I can remember that the most frustrating thing for me as a young organizer is when I'd ask a woman at her desk who was working as secretary, if I could talk to her about the union and she would tell me, you know, she had to ask her husband first um, if she could talk to me. That was like so frustrating. It was like, you know, I didn't get it. Um, but again, like I said before, okay, this is where she's at, right? And then you say, okay, let's talk to your husband, right? Can I come to your house? Can we meet with your husband together, right? So you figure out uh, what it is, uh, where they're coming from and, um, I mean, the younger women, in my experience, were more open, but that may not have been the case in, in the union days. That was really my experience, but that might not have been the case in the early days of 9 to 5. What was your experience, though? Yeah, um, our, 9 to 5 in Boston was started by young women, um, but uh, it didn't stay that way. And I think you see in the documentary how somebody says uh, the real core of the union drive was women in their 40s, middle-aged women who really pushed the thing through. And this this had to do with something else that we were surprised by early on. We thought that people who were kind of alienated from the whole work world, who maybe didn't dress so carefully or who were bored on their jobs, we thought they were going to be the core of nine to five, and they were not. The people who were the core of nine to five were impeccably dressed they cared deeply about their jobs. They cared deeply about their careers. And that's why they wanted to be active. So again, we had to let go of a lot of assumptions. And the, the lesson about meeting people where they're at, you know, if it's a, a difference in age or race or class, we tried to build an organization where everybody would feel comfortable. And we did that by paying really close attention to each person. Jackie, you have a question? And, and just adding that making working hard throughout our our lives, and all of you know this, right? Trying to have diverse leadership, right? That represented uh, women of all races and all ages and so on. So that was like core of what the work is when you're organizing, right? And leaders who represent the members you're trying to recruit. Yeah. 
Mm. How about, can I ask a question? How about geographically in the South of the US? Did you get many people to join? Our Atlanta chapter was one of our most vibrant chapters. Um, so, uh, you know, Atlanta is different from the rest of the South. So um, I think, you know, but we went to Atlanta on purpose um, in order to bring in that part of the, of the population. And honestly, you probably know, all of you probably know as well as I do, how much difficulty the labor movement has had organizing in the South, right? Because of the laws, because of attitudes, there's very little union density. So we were never very successful organizing uh, in the union in the South. Mm -hmm. um, but we tried in SEIU for years and, you know, with minor successes, but not, not much. Hmm. Jackie, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, no, I was just, uh, when Annie asked her question, I was, I was remembering actually, I was gonna comment on, in fact, uh, 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 some of what you were saying about relationship building, nurturing relationships and how important that was and, and starting with where people are. And I, I was remembering what uh, Vera Barksdale was saying. She was one of the organizers in Atlanta, if I remember correctly, about how, um, he, uh, what her techniques was, if you ask somebody to go to a meeting, you ask them, ask them what they're gonna bring. Are they gonna bring chips or cookies? Because that way they're invested, you know? That way they'll really show up, <laughs> they're committed. And also uh, about pairing um, black women with white women and older women with younger women to, to help create those kind of relationships that wouldn't necessarily occur otherwise and to make make that, create those kind of bonds. I, think, I thought that was really interesting. And what, just what all, uh, you, you both have said about starting with where people are and not judging them from where they are, but just saying, okay, this is information. This, uh, and and using that and not always um, and also what what was mentioned in the movie about um, that it was serious work but you didn't always want to take it seriously you wanted it to do some fun or some humor I re I'm remembering the people demonstrating out there in these dressed as Tipex bottles and saying white out discrimination or something like that you know um, white out low pay I guess it was I thought that was there was a lot of creativity uh, in the movement, from what I could tell. And and also starting with where people are and the, the issues that concern them. That one of the other things that stayed with me in the movie was uh, that the Washington State clerical workers, when they got getting so upset about, um, as a cost-cutting measure, the management eliminating the tampon machines. And so when you all realized that was important to them and took that on as an issue, it, it served two purposes. I mean, it was responding to somebody uh, to a need expressed or a concern expressed by the workers, but it also made management so uncomfortable to talk about it in meetings. So it kind of gave you some leverage there. I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, the, the whole sort of gleeful yeah. spirit in which we went after some of these bosses, like the boss who had asked his secretary to sew up a hole in his pants while he was wearing them, or the boss who fired his secretary for bringing him a corned beef sandwich on white bread instead of rye. Uh, you know, we would show up on our lunch hour and people were just like laughing and having a ball. And that that helped people sort of get over their fears. Um, and as you said, you expressed it so well, you know, the, the whole issue of Tampax made these management negotiators have to leave the room. They were so embarrassed. So helped us win a good contract. Lisa, you had another question? Yeah, um, actually I wanted to know at one point you went from being a volunteer, maybe that's for Ellen, uh, to actually paid workers because it, it seemed like you were doing so much work. I can't imagine how you can do that, especially going into offices when you're working full time. So if you could explain how that, um, you know, if you have like look, how many liberated people, as you would say here, I don't know what the word is in English, um, who don't have to work in their regular job that they're paid for. People who get release time to to dedicate to the union full time, it, was, it would be the equivalent here in Spain. Well, in my case, when we started out sitting around in a circle, the 10 of us, uh, we were all volunteers. And then we put out the newsletter for a year and then we realized we didn't know what to do next. And the group scraped together our pennies and sent me to a school for organizers that was just starting up. 
And I was there for the summer and I came back and I quit my job as a clerk typist. And we, again, raised a little money. We got an office at the YWCA and I became a full-time staff person. I did that for, for 12 years. So yeah, we recognized that we needed some staff people and we needed leaders who were working and we needed members as well. Elizabeth, you have your hand up? Yeah, it's... Uh... I'm not even sure it's a question more as a, I, I wonder what the arc is from the nine to five movement to the Me Too movement. Like, I wonder what you think about how things evolved in the Me Too movement. It would probably take a whole nother call to talk about it, but it just makes me wonder at the similarities and the differences and the changes and the technology and the collaboration or, or lack of collaboration. You know, it's just sort of an interesting arc to draw from one to the other. You know, would the other ever have happened without the kind of work you did? Yeah, it's almost a rhetorical question, but I think maybe not. Yeah, well, sexual harassment, the term didn't actually start being used until 1975, two years after we started. And we certainly heard instances of sexual harassment throughout the nine to five organizing. Um, we didn't focus in on it specifically all that much, although we sort of skirt around the edges of it. Um, I pun think intended. We, pun, pun intended. Pun intended, skirted around the edge of it. Um, I think what's similar is, um, and I think this is really relevant to the labor movement today, is that we uh, organized in kind of a like citywide manner, raising a hullabaloo everywhere. And we kind of relied on our actions to have uh, repercussions throughout the city. Whereas union organizing, as it had traditionally been done, was workplace by workplace, election by election, where you had to win a majority and so on. It was more like a you know political election of the president or whatever. Um, I think the future of the labor movement is going to incorporate both of those elements. For example, everyone in the United States today knows all about the Starbucks organizing. And that's not because people are winning those little elections store by store is because they've managed to create a hullabaloo all over the country. And the president of or the CEO or the recently retired CEO of Starbucks is right out there on the news and is being called up in front of Congress and so on. And um, so it, it's, it's become larger than just the uh, vote by vote situation. Um, and that's the case with a lot of um, labor organizing in American history, the garment workers, the sit down strikes. Um, it, it became larger than just the uh, what the union was able to do vote by vote by vote. And that's what's so exciting about what's happening today is Amazon, everyone knows about it. You know, you think about it all the time. And, and uh, that's true about me too, as well. It's, it's not so much like what they were able to do in one particular workplace or with one particular egregious boss, it just exploded and became a nationwide issue. Yeah, global actually. Yeah, I global wanted issue. to say that. I mean, I, weren't you weren't we all weren't you all just like so angry in some ways when Me Too happened? Because I felt like, don't we know this stuff is bad and we're not going to let it happen anymore? And then you hear these stories of this egregious shit happening, right? to work to women workers and why is it still happening? We fought this, you know, 40 years ago and we know yeah. it's bad and we know it's illegal. And then Me Too happens. And like you said, it blows up. I think it's media. I think it's, we learn more quickly through uh, the, the kind of media that we have today. Um, but I was proud actually in some ways that like, well, I guess it's happening again, but more consciousness is being raised again through the Me Too movement, right? I was glad that was happening. Um, I just hope we don't have to do it again, right? In 20 years, that's gonna have, you know, that this shit's still gonna be happening, God forbid. Any more questions or? And I, I have a comment. I was, I actually was thinking about that when before, when you were talking about what's going on now, that was gonna be my question. Where do you think the labor movement's moving because of Starbucks and Amazon? It seemed to me, for me, I mean, there was a time when uh, the labor unions were disappearing on a, on a certain level. 
you know, the people were voting against them. I didn't, which, you know, why would people vote against their own interests? But they do. Um, so where do you think, what, what do you, what do you see for the future? Well, you know, it's interesting. Who knows why, right? This generation, the uh, polls are showing much more favor of unions right now than we have in the, in the time I was a union organizer, much more interest uh, and favorable ratings of labor unions. Young people uh, are more favorable. Um, the things like Starbucks and Amazon are happening. The biggest problem is because it's so hard and the laws are so stacked against us, you can't organize a union in a traditional sense in the United States. I really don't, I, I mean, I think it's very, very hard to do, especially on a big scale, like they're trying to do with Amazon. So I'm a believer in sort of new kinds of organizing that's happening, right? And successfully, right? The kinds of, of um, I know, almost, almost like, uh, almost like uh, nine to five, but some new versions of it online organizing that's happening. Um, I was SEIU, I was a part of the Fight for 15 um, that happened in the United States, which, you know, we wanted it to be about organizing traditional unions, but it really wasn't. It was about raising consciousness, putting workers in motion and winning for workers. And it made a huge difference in our country, right? The 15 minimum wage is now, um, you know, a standard or a given at least for many of us. And it took a huge fight to get there, but we never won a traditional union. So I believe that labor unions have to be, are being and have to be smart about finding new forms of organizing because the interest is certainly there and God knows um, workers need it and workers know they need, uh, need unions, right? You know, it's, it's always frustrating when, um, when you see like Amazon and that one in New York, right? I think they won, they the union won and then they had a, a, a voting someplace else from in the South, I don't remember, the, and, the, and they lost. And it's like, well, how, did, how can that happen? You know, it's it's frustrating when you see that that thing that those things happen. There was intimidation, excuse me, and severe. Yeah, it wasn't an accident. I mean, they really no. Did, and Amazon I mean, was really, really well. It was yeah. They were brutal. I'm sure there they were a lot of there was a lot of intimidation, a lot of underhanded things happening. Yeah, but still, it's still frustrating that that yeah, didn't have enough votes vote in the union. Yeah. Right. They said that they would um, have to close down if people get, be, get, joined the union so they'd lose their job. I mean, that's kind of misinformation. Jackie, you want to you have your hand up? Yeah, this is a, perhaps a minor question, but I was, something that made me curious when, uh, when I was watching the movie, um, watching the documentary, one of the... Uh, it seemed like one key moment in one of your campaigns was when you discovered that in, in Boston, when you discovered that the, um, the employers had a secret organization and they were fixing wages, they were setting a green on wages, which was illegal. And it was called the Boston Survey Group, I think. How did you discover that? How did you find out about that? I think it was a reporter who first uh, alerted us to this. Um, but uh, once we were on the trail, then guess who types the agendas for the Boston Survey Group? Uh, so we started receiving in the mail, here's the agenda for the next meeting. Here's who's going to be there. And we were able to follow them around and show up outside their meetings. Um, and so it wasn't hard at all to track their activities. And then we ended up getting the um, the Attorney General of Massachusetts to file a lawsuit against them because it was illegal and a sort of a groundbreaking agreement was made where they had to stop doing a lot of what they were doing and be more public and so on. And it affected the whole country. Um, if you don't have any more questions, Lisa, yeah. did you put your hand up just now? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just I'd like to, um, well, um, I think it was you, Kim, who said that, um, I'm not sure, uh, well, like the film was started 50 years ago and everything has improved uh, pretty much um, and that there's no discrimination against women who are pregnant. I found that now there's discrimination of mothers 
and that there's the assumption that if you're a mother, you can't be as attentive to your job. And so um, actually I went back to the States one year when I was living here and I tried, I gave it my best to work and I found it impossible because I was a single mother and I was working for an academic organization, a nonprofit, they were all feminists. And um, I had no place to leave my son or, or I couldn't afford. And I met, um, you know, the childcare he would need. And I remember one boss who was a vice president of, you know, integrative liberal learning. I mean, it wasn't that department, it was another one. She said, oh, get a nanny. And I said, on my salary, I can't afford a nanny. I mean, I am not even paying the rent. You know what, it just this, this disconnect of, um, you know, what it's like to be a single mother. I mean, I just, I gave up and I came back to Spain. So it was much easier here to have that life work balance. So I just wanted to say that, I mean, I've done some research about that, um, you know, a work-life balance and it seems like that's the new frontier. Um, hopefully we'll get through in another, I don't know how long it'll take, but I wonder if you yeah. have any thoughts uh, about that. Yeah, I do. I agree with you. I think that it's it is shocking how rigid our uh, workplace is for people with families, men and women. Um, it it's it, there's no other country like this, and it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and so something's got to give, and I I'm hopeful that changes will be made. Jackie, do you have uh, your hand up? And then we'll try to close up. It's, it's yeah, I, was just gonna, I, I just had a couple of things to comment. One is that, that Lisa is actually, uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, Lisa, but Lisa has worked on a lot of really, really interesting documentaries herself uh, here in Spain and elsewhere, I think, too, if I'm not um, mistaken, Lisa, as well as a, a featured film with Ken Loach, right? You know, Land and Liberty. And um, and so she's, she's got a lot of interesting experience. But uh, Kind of in closing, too, one of the, the things I, I took away from the movie was that it, you know, it seemed like a really exciting time um, and an exhausting time, probably for all of you as well. But that one of the things I took away from it was that there were some incredible successes and there were some really dispiriting failures. And in spite of the dispiriting failures, you managed to pick yourselves up and keep going. And I, I, I think that's you know, persisting, which is. Uh, one of the the most important things there. You, if you want to respond to that, no. if you want to make change, you better be willing to uh, you know take a few blows and fall down, stand up, and get up and keep going. Right? I mean, it's just like that's the nature of the beast. If you want to change, uh, make change, right, and organize. So yes, yeah, thank you. I, thank you. I just want to quote from a, an old labor song that says, freedom, freedom is a hard one thing. You've got to work for it, fight for it, day and night for it. And every generation has got to win it again. So mm -hmm. You never get there. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. feels like what's where we're at now with me too. And then hopefully won't go back again. But anyway, um, if there's an, no one else has any questions, it's, uh, it's a little bit past eight at nine o'clock. And so it's, Time to close. Doris, I did want to just mention, because I think I heard somebody asking this before mm -hmm. I was able to figure out the technology. Um, the Go ahead. If you haven't seen the film yet, go ahead and watch it. I think that link will be good, at least for a little while, until Steve changes the um, password. But I think maybe for the next month, you're probably safe to share it. Okay. And and definitely worthwhile watching. It was really inspiring. Yeah. I watched it yesterday. So yeah. Don't right. forget to order my book, Working 9 to 5. <laughs> as well let's see we can put it back lower in the chat again one second if i can find it here it is thank you so much thank you all for inviting us this is yeah, wonderful to meet you such a delight wonderful thank you everybody yes yeah okay thank you very i'm i'm having trouble with the chat sorry i'm a little you can bit put it in our signal chat instead okay oh wait here we go i got it now there it is as well. Okay. Thank you, for your courage. All right. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. All right. It was really Bye, interesting. Have a nice evening. All right. Bye. Bye.